Today's speaker is Malihai Ali Kani. I hope I said that right. Yes, um, and sure. this is her first semester as a faculty member at University of Pittsburgh. And unfortunately, because of the pandemic, we haven't been able to meet her in person yet. Um, she got her PhD in Rutgers, and she works on multimodal um, discourse, including images and uh, images and language, images and text. Um, today, Molly Hay is going to tell us more about images and text. So, um, thank you for accepting our invitation to speak, and uh, please go ahead. Thank you so much, Lori, for the nice introduction. Thanks everyone for participating. I wish this was in person, uh, but uh, we are at least in the same uh, city. Uh, I'm going to tell you today about the research that I've been uh, doing the last uh, three years and some of the new projects that I've started uh, with my uh, first year PhD students. Uh, that would be like less than four months ago. Um, so, um, communication is naturally multimodal. Kids start pointing uh, before they start talking, and we use all, ki all kinds of all forms of multimodal signals um, to get our messages across every day, raising our hands to ask questions, police officers use their gestures to control the traffic, and so uh, communication is multimodal, but this is even more evident when we look at uh, social media data, um, data that we, we collect from the internet. Like um, all, most of the tweets are either paired with a hyperlink, with a link or, or an image or, or a diagram. Instagram uh, posts hide different types of text with images. Reddit posts include images. And so, most of the classic problems in NLP, if we want to think about them these days, especially if we want to think about using uh, web data uh, for them, they are kind of uh, multimodal uh, NLP problems, and thus we need to realize how to do information management um, and work with multimodal data sets. And machines are catching up, new generations of um, Amazon uh, conversational uh, devices are equipped with a screen, um, audio devices at the museums are uh, being replaced with um, these uh, virtual agents that can actually narrate the stories, robots teach kids uh, a second language, and you know, especially after this pandemic, we had several uh, basically uh, educational resources, uh, conversational avatars that could teach students different levels, different topics, but this, there is a new hype these days um, because of the situation that we have. And, and technically most of the systems, you know, um, in order for these systems, in order to be able to naturally interact with the users, they have to realize multimodal contributions that they receive, um, gestures, eye gaze, and other types of uh, multimodal signals, they should also be able to use in a broad range of uh, appropriate modalities to communicate effectively with the user. Most of my, uh, my recent works have been revolved around these type of multimodal communication. I have worked on diagrams, multimodal document understanding, human-robot collaboration, conversational AI, mostly multimodal conversational AI, cognitive science, and today I am mostly going to talk about um, a couple of my works in the area of uh, visually grounded natural language understanding and generation. Integrating visual presentations and uh, space with language requires oftentimes learning common sense inferences. Give you an example. This is a, a screenshot from New York Times post that says global warming is causing spring to arrive early and autumn to come late in many places and not all species are adapting at the same rate. You see that these polar bear, we rely on our background knowledge and the common sense knowledge and basically match it with the word species and, and the fact that it's miserably standing on, on a piece of melting ice cube tell us that this is a kind of species that's not adapting very well with, uh, with the rate of global warming changes. And so uh, basically there are invisible links that connect the content of text and imagery and we oftentimes rely on our background knowledge and common sense knowledge to make these connections. 
what I'm going to argue is that although at the surface, at the surface level, uh, visual and linguistic communications are vastly different. They communicate differently, they, they have different characteristics. However, they have similar intentional, contextual, and inferential properties. And so in this first talk, I'm going to argue that uh, coherence modeling that I'm going to explain in a second what it is can help us connect, can help us teach machines um, to connect uh, text and imagery. Um, so I'm going to start with giving you uh, two examples. The, the left-hand side one, a view from the bridge. When we look at this caption, we don't expect to see the bridge itself because we rely on our knowledge, uh, background knowledge that says when you're standing on a bridge, you don't see it. So this the space perfectly shows the is, is the right caption or the right uh, text for the image. Whereas different captions play different roles. The right-hand side example, for instance, is just the um, the most immediate explanation of this image. A man is sitting in front of a bunch of fruits and perhaps the image carries more uh, information load than the, in, um, than the text. Surface level models that fail to take into account these different inferences um, suffer from systematic problems. They fail to make the right generalizations or um, learn to describe the content of the images uh, properly. At CVPR, uh, the CVPR uh, workshop, CVPR 2019, uh, there was a competition on a uh, conceptual caption data set um, hosted by Google. Um, and they describe basically two main problems with these models. The first one is content hallucination, where the model fails to learn the right representations of the image and uh, come up with the right description for that content. And in this case, a close-up of a stuffed animal on a plate has the wrong description, has the right wrong spatial description, basically. And the second um, type of problems is where the model basically hallucinates uh, about some contextual uh, information um, if, uh, in the image. Uh, for instance, uh, in this case, the model says, this is the new manager of the team. And that is mainly because uh, the, the, in the first example, content hallucination often exists when you work with um, smaller data sets such as MS Coco or Flickr data set, whereas when you go to the conceptual caption data set that is um, an order of magnitude uh, larger. However, it's uh, all text paired with images from all over the web that they've scraped. Um, this uh, different kinds of background information that exists in that data set um, makes these models to hallucinate about the context of images. So, uh, the classic architecture of these models is that they receive an image as an input, they have an image understanding module, that information gets passed to the text generation module and they, just, and they uh, generate a description in the form of natural language that describe the content of the image. Now the hope was that when we use very powerful cont um, uh, object detection uh, you know, modules, powerful computer uh, vision algorithms and transformers, um, state of the art generation techniques in natural language processing, perhaps these powerful models with millions of uh, parameters and a large, very large data set, uh, they can learn these patterns, you know, whether the image is inserting it back, whether there is background information involved in the description or not. Um, but that was not true. And the whole point of the workshop was that there are these problems that we still need to deal with. Uh, we still don't know how to deal with. And so the paper that I'm going to describe in the next 10 or 15 minutes, I am going to uh, propose a solution uh, to solve these problems in, uh, for, image, for generating descriptions for images. So what I'm going to argue is that um, common sense understanding doesn't actually fall out of the um, uh, out of the scope of the machine learning models. However, these systems need some starting points uh, to learn to decide about the types of inferences that connect these, uh, that connect the text, the caption and the image. And thus, when they have those starting points, they can learn the right generalizations on their own.
And specifically, I'm going to argue that coherence relations can provide information about how the content of uh, it, coherence relations that uh, has been traditionally used in uh, NLP for studying common sense inference in text, um, provide uh, information about how to uh, segments um, of discourse to utterances um, are related to one another. Um, now, I'll give you an example to tell you what coherence theories that was um, proposed by specifically the uh, citation that I mentioned by Jerry Hobbs. Oops. Uh, what it is, and then I will tell you how I'm going to extend these framework uh, to um, understand inferences in text and imagery. So the coherence theory argues that uh, what we infer uh, from sentences goes beyond the, the two sentences, but um, the relationship, the inferences that connect the content of uh, these two discourse segments. I missed my meeting today, my car broke down, when, you, when we read these, um, these two sentences, we automatically infer that the reason why I missed my meeting today is because my car broke down. This actually doesn't work in the context of pandemic. I should say, I missed my meeting to today. My cat was sitting on my laptop or something like that. Uh, so uh, compare this, contrast this with another sentence. I missed my meeting today, they fired me. In this case, they fired me is as a result of why, um, the, the, the fact that I missed my meeting today. So uh, this uh, framework of bringing in these inferences that connect the, um, the content of uh, sentences um, has been helpful um, for solving different NLP, different problems in NLP. And that's largely due to the um, annotation campaigns um, that almost 20 years ago, people started uh, putting together uh, large corpora such as Penn Discourse Tree Bank or um, RSD Discourse Tree Bank, where they annotated uh, these inferences and relations in between um, discourse segments in Wall Street Journal articles. And since then, there, there's been a, a number of works in different areas, different, different applications, such as sentiment analysis, text summarization, and information extraction, that people have used these kinds of inferences to uh, basically design uh, better models. What I argued uh, was that similar to two text spans that are connected with these inferences, images and text are also um, um, connected with different uh, kinds of inferences. For instance, in this particular pair, you're seeing different temporal links. Uh, the image uh, is showing how you should um, basically flatten the, dot, the action in, at the image shows sometimes in the middle of the action, but also the result um, of the action that's described in the text. The image is presenting a tool that is not uh, mentioned in the text. So in a, in a sense, the image is elaborating um, on the ways that you can carry out this action. And so coherence relations, I argue, it can also describe interpretations in text and imagery. When we want to characterize coherence relations in text and imagery, we have a much difficult, harder job in comparison with text. Why? Because uh, in text, oftentimes annotators rely on explicit markers, such as because or however, to mark these relations. When we move to text and imagery, we don't we, we lose those cues. Even if people want to um, annotate implicit relations in text. Uh, one of the standard ways to find those relations is by inserting these markers. But this job is harder when we are working in the multimodal context. So um, I, I led an annota annotation campaign and work with a group, group of linguists and cognitive scientists at Rutgers um, and, and actually hired expert annotators when we um, characterize those relations and annotated 10,000 uh, um, image text pairs uh, from the conceptual caption data set out of which 5,000 uh, were from the ground truth, it was from the ground truth part and 5,000 from the results of the 10 state of the art image captioning models in 2019 to understand what's going on with these, um, with these models. Um, and this uh, data set that we have annotated is a diverse data set. It, it includes uh, posts from 
image text from uh, blog posts, from news resources, um, from ads, uh, and so on. So uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to, uh, I'm not going to walk you over, um, over the relations, but I want to uh, show you this, uh, that the coherence relations can, uh, what my, our observation uh, was that coherence relations can, can predict discourse strong. So different um, image text pairs coming from different genres, they have a different distribution. Um, of coherence relations. The news uh, resources have a very different distribution when you look at it and you compare it with um, a catalog, for example, or ads. Well, so we have this large corpus uh, of image text pairs annotated with coherence relations. Can we predict them? Uh, I described several baseline models uh, in the paper where I where the model takes as input both the text and I use a um, I use birds and for learning a representation of an image I use graph rise uh, and several more layers to basically uh, learn a better representation. And we basically learn a, uh, an end to end model that takes as input the text and the image and uh, predict the relations that exist between uh, those pairs. I also um, describe baselines where, where I only look at text and not the image just to see how, um, and the other way around, um, to see how helpful they are in different, uh, for different relations. And so our best performing model um, with 74% uh, um, a FAUNA score can predict the right relations in text and images. Now, you may say that uh, this is a very expensive process because you hired expert annotators. After that, uh, annotating that data set, I also um, at, tried to ask mechanical thinkers to characterize several logical, temporal, and elaboration-like relationship between text and imagery. However, instead of providing the, uh, the uh, definition, uh, the technical definition of these relations, this time I just tried to ask simple questions from Turkers, you know, whether the image shows action in progress, for example. And then again, with just a simple SVM classification, um, uh, I could, uh, you could see that uh, we can easily learn and predict these relations in, uh, in text and uh, imagery. For instance, the image depicts action in progress. Uh, the text, uh, it, when you look at the features, the text includes add, mix, uh, whereas when the text has a specification that uh, are not visualized in the image, um, we have half and two minutes cop. Another important, um, another interesting observation and important, uh, basically, uh, fact about uh, th these uh, different coherence relations before um, I move on to the, to explain the architecture of the generation uh, model for you is that when we analyze uh, the linguistic properties of these um, pairs in different, uh, with different relations, we observe that they have um, different linguistic, uh, basically structure and different um, cues that can uh, signal the kinds of interpretations um, that exist between that, uh, those pairs. Like for instance, we discussed this example, a man is sitting in front of a bunch of fruits. Most of the captions, uh, most of the pairs in uh, Flickr, MS Coco, these kinds of captions data said, uh, we found that show a distinctively limited distribution of verbs um, and they are mostly present, uh, continuous or simple present. And uh, specifically, they have a particular taste for lexical aspects. Um, about, uh, but, but they are also very limited. Um, so we, I call sub top 17 verbs uh, in the caption corpora caption verbs. And caption verbs include verbs such as walking, talking, uh, sitting, uh, standing. Uh, and you can see that in, in the results of the models, these are the state of the art models, 84% of the sentences that these models generate, they're using one of these 17 verbs. Right. What about lexical aspect? If you're not familiar with different classes in lexical aspect, um, 
uh, we have uh, events and states, and events can be atelic or telic. Uh, so here is an example of an atelic um, of an atelic event. A man is running in the park. That man, um, that where uh, atelic events don't uh, describe a particular endpoint. Um, uh, Whereas the telic verbs, uh, they explicitly describe an endpoint, a woman arrived at the party. Our analysis shows that Flickr and Coco, uh, more than 95% of captions in these corpora are atelic uh, verbs or uh, indefinite temporal events. Whereas uh, in American national corpora, that, that is all just text and not multimodal, only 31% of the um, of events are atelic, but this is not necessarily the case in all, all of the multimodal corpora. For instance, the multimodal recipe data set recipe Q&A has only 40% atelic descriptions. At the time when I was, um, when I hired annotators to tell me whether this, these events are atelic or telic, we didn't have a model that can tell us whether that we can run on these data sets and learn whether the events are telic or atelic or what is the percentage of the state verbs. So as another kind of site uh, research, we uh, worked on developing um, a rather a sizable data set of um, uh, sentences annotated with different lexical aspect uh, classes, and uh, this includes caption, dialogue data set, uh, Wikipedia, uh, across John, and we describe a distributional semantic model that can tell whether um, that can predict the distributional semant the lexical aspect of of the events. Um, I also asked this question, what about other languages? Well, maybe captions in English just are populated with, uh, with atelic events. What about Arabic, Russian, German, Chinese, Farsi? Um, and so this is just an example that shows you how different speakers of different languages can describe the content of an, of an image. The Arabic caption says, a girl is talking with the phone. You have to, in Arabic, you, kind of, you have to mention the gender. Uh, in Chinese, uh, we have she's using the phone um, and you see how many verbs basically they're using using a phone to talk, whereas in English or in Arabic, we have only one verb uh, for this action. And in Farsi, we, we don't have gendered pronoun. We don't necessarily mention, uh, uh, for instance, if it's a she or a he. So we, we see that the caption is a person is talking with the phone. So we um, collected data for uh, Arabic, Chinese, Farsi, German, and Russian. The observation that captions are populated with atelic events is true in all of these languages. However, you see that there are very interesting um, language, language specific um, observations that we have, for instance, in Russian, um, the, the difference between state and a telic is, is a very uh, subtle one. And so you see the distributions are um, very different, vastly different from Arabic. Uh, whereas in Arabic, there are very little, uh, the very few um, telic events exist um, in the, in the uh, caption corpora. And that is uh, consistent with the observation that we had for English. And just want to tell you that for a controlled subsample of 500 images, when we collect captions in different uh, languages, you can see how the distribution of gender across languages is, is different in different languages for same images. Okay, so we have um, basically a large data set. We can um, use that uh, and we have machine learning models that can predict uh, coherence relations between text and imagery. Now we want to uh, use that model first to annotate um, all of the conceptual captions data set that includes over 3 million image text pairs. And then um, I'm going to describe a transformer-based generation model that uses GraphRise um, for uh, learning image features. And we use Google Cloud API to detect uh, objects for, gener for uh, basically designing or describing a coherence aware generation model um, that respects these um, different discourse goals.
So GraphRise employs a ResNet 101 network to classify images into over 4 dm classes. We also use a, a pre-trained vector train to predict objects. We have an, a strong object classifier. These gets passed to a transformer encoder. The job of the transformer encoder is to change uh, the context-dependent embeddings to context-dependent embeddings. Uh, an example of that can be you have a person and a bike. Now the job of the transformer encoder is to say a person is riding a bike. At the transformer encoder also receives the coherence label for um, as an input. This information um, uh, gets passed to the transformer decoder, their imprint transformer decoder, the coherence label, whether you know you want a story like caption with, with the background information or no, you just want a descriptive caption. So that kind of information gets passed to the transformer decoder. But here, this is uh, the start token or the go token. The coherence label is the go token of the transformer decoder. So similar to an RNN architecture where the hidden layer or the control have the control very much on the outcome of the generation here at two times we're really making sure that the model attends uh, the discourse goal that is requested and so the result of this is a um, is a model that can uh, takes as input an image and the types of caption that you want and it will generate um, that particular type of caption uh, for you the overall um, results overall, we, we could reduce uh, with this model the rate of irrelevant captions um, by seven uh, seven percent. You can see that um, when you need just a descriptive caption that describes the content of the image from this model, over 80% of the time you can get that, whereas that rate was 52% on average uh, in the 10 state-of-the-art models that we described. Now I'm going to just give you an example. So here, a coherence of our visible um, um, model our coherence level if, if we want a visible or descriptive caption it will say the pizza at a restaurant but the coherence agnostic one can be pizza the best pizza in the world for instance um, or like a story like caption if you specifically for this picture you want a story like caption it will give you how to spend a day as opposed to dog playing on the beach we, uh, apart from uh, having expert annotators annotate the result of the, um, uh, the model, what we did, we asked uh, mechanical turkers several questions. Um, we, we asked uh, how good are these captions, uh, and uh, basically, you know, we give them two options to choose between the coherence of air and the coherence agnostic caption, and 68% of the time they chose the coherence. Uh, the model of the coherence of their, the output of the coherence of their model. We asked about the quality and the relevance of, um, of these captions. And um, one observation was that uh, automatic scores such as CIDR when we tried them, although people, both uh, expert annotators and crowd, uh, crowd workers prefer the results of the coherence um, a VAIR model, uh, these automatic metrics such as CIDR, um, they, they couldn't make any basically finding difference between um, the outcome of these models. And so as uh, I want to also briefly mention that I am, I, uh, we're, we're not the first to study the uh, links between text and imagery. However, this work was the first work uh, that uh, attempts to characterize information level inference, uh, inferences between uh, images and text. There are other works that look at uh, different emotions that uh, captions describe um, or works that look at uh, basically what modality uh, has the more weight. Um, is it the image or, or the text? Uh, none of these works, um, basically, uh, I argue in the paper that um, have been used for generation uh, purposes. It's uh, basically classifying what modality includes uh, more weight, for instance, or more import is more important. I think the closest to our work is uh, is this detecting attention and engaging perceptual reasoning um, by uh, Kroc et al. in 2019 EMNLP. Um, 
I work towards building human level AI entities that can work with people on a broad range of problem and they can use a variety of modalities, methods and knowledge. Um, with that, I'd like to thank uh, my collaborators, uh, mechanical turkers that have annotated tons and tons of data for me in the last four years and funding agencies. And thank you very much for the invitation um, and for, for listening to me. For uh, I think this is the largest audience that I've ever had. I really look forward to uh, meet you in person and to collaborate with you. Um, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Um, clapping for everybody. Thank you for introducing us to all the